Of late, we have been blessed with the opportunity to expand our television network all over the United States with the Superstation uh, in Chicago and many others. And that is why I want you to write to me and let me know that you are watching one of those new stations that we are on now. I want to send you a free subscription to the monthly magazine called My Journal. It will bless you, it will encourage you, it will inform you, and it will make you a truly active believer in Jesus Christ. Get in touch with us. My Journal is the monthly publication of Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. And Jesus said that in the Beatitudes. Each month, My Journal offers practical weekly devotionals from Dr. Youssef and exciting ministry reports from our on the ground field teams. This is a great resource to not only cultivate your personal faith, but to also stay informed about how God is moving in our world today. As our gift to you, we would like to send you a free six month subscription to encourage you in your walk with Christ. To receive your free My Journal, call now or sign up at ltw.org. Beloved, the Church of Jesus Christ is made up of sour, moping, sulking, complaining servants of God. No, we are the soldiers of the conquering Lord. As a conquering soldier, instead of living in fear, we should be sending terror into the heart of the devil. We need to live in victory as we surrender to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord Almighty in battle. of seeing your loved ones after a period of separation. It's a great joy. In many ways, Psalm 24, which we'll be looking at in a minute, is an exuberance, enthusiastic way of expressing a reunion. Psalm 24 expresses really a childlike enthusiasm at a reunion. I'm going to tell you in a minute, but before I do that, it's amazing to me how our Lord Jesus, so many times in the Scripture, uses a child as an example. He talked about a childlike faith, a childlike innocence, a childlike enthusiasm, and a childlike trust. Now, let me tell you about this psalmist, childlike enthusiasm childlike exuberance, a childlike joy at this reunion. Story time. The nation of Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant to their enemies, the Philistines. When God delivered His people Israel out of the slavery of Egypt, and He made a covenant with them, and, and He said that, I will never leave you. He said, when you forsake me, I will take my hands off in protection, but I will never leave you. My presence will be with you always. And as a symbol of that presence, it's going to be that box, the Ark of the Covenant. It's a, it's a little box. Really, it's not all that big. And inside it, there were three things, basically. There was the tablets of the Ten Commandments. There was a jar of the manna to remind them of God's faithfulness and providing for them in the wilderness. And there was the staff of Moses that God used in a miraculous way, including parting of the Red Sea. Now, the magic was not in the Ark of the Covenant, just like the magic is not in the symbols of wine and bread, just a symbol of our Lord's death and resurrection. That Ark represented more than just that symbol of God's presence. It represents their national loyalty to Yahweh. It represented who they are as God's unique people. It represents the very security and life of Israel. But for seven long months, the people of God were separated from the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of the presence of God. 
um, for seven long months, the enemies, the Philistines, thought that if they can hijack the Ark of the Covenant, they can also hijack the power of God to work for them. They confused the symbol for the real thing. And so they usurped the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> but instead of bringing them a blessing, it brought them a curse. The Ark brought death and destruction to the Philistines. The very source of blessing for God's people, Israel, became a snare to the enemies of God's people. And so the Philistines said, who wants that? <laughs> Take it back. Take it back to the Israelites. And so they returned it. And here, as this reunion takes place between God's people and the symbol of his presence, as this reunion takes place, David, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he sits down and he records this in Psalm 24. He is celebrating the reunion with the symbol of God's presence. He is celebrating with joyful thanksgiving, with enthusiasm, and with exuberance. And so, if you haven't already turned to Psalm 24, I want to tell you something else about the context of this psalm. I pray that it will bless your socks as it blessed mine. <laughs> After the temple was built, the priests of Israel designated certain psalms to be sung at certain days of the week. For example, on Wednesdays, they sung Psalm 94. On Fridays, they sung Psalm 93. On Sundays, the very first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, they sung Psalm 24. Listen carefully. <laughs> Think with me. The day our Lord Jesus Christ entered into Jerusalem, in which we call Palm Sunday, when he triumphantly entered into Jerusalem, the priests were singing Psalm 24, which you have just read. On Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, when our Lord Jesus Christ rose, defeating death in the grave, the priest in the temple, unbeknown to them, they were singing Psalm 24. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? I had one man revival just thinking about that. Three things that I want to share with you from the psalm. Psalm 24. First, you look at verses 1 and 2, and you find the declaration of the Lord's ownership of the whole universe. Secondly, in verses 3 to 6, you see the Lord's offer, which is the ultimate offer. And thirdly, verses 7 to 10, you find the Lord's conquering and overcoming to be unavoidable, inevitable. So let's look at the first two verses. The Lord's ownership of the universe. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. I love that old translation. <laughs> the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Some of you probably already thinking or saying in your mind, oh, wait a minute, Michael, but I thought the earth belongs to Satan. I thought Satan is the prince of the air. I thought the earth is controlled by Satan. Now, the people who belong to Satan on the earth controlled by Satan. So, I want you to hang in there with me. I'm going to explain it. The Lord's territorial claim is the ownership of the entire universe, the countless stars, the vast space empires, the uh, unfathomable uh, orbits. They are all His. Can you say that with me? They are all His. And yet one out of the millions upon millions upon millions of planets and galaxies, the maker and the owner of the whole universe focuses just on that one planet. Of all of them. Why the Earth? Why Earth, planet Earth? Why not Mars? Why not uh, Mercury? Why not Venus? Why not uh, Saturn or, or Nipton? Why? Why planet Earth, which is really a speck when you think about it, in relationship to all the size of the big planets? 
Because, beloved, nowhere in the universe does God need to assert himself and his ownership as in the planet Earth. Long before Adam and Eve and long before the Garden of Eden, long before the serpent in the garden, long before creation, Lucifer, who was the angel of light, Lucifer, who reflected the light of God, Lucifer, who served at the throne of God, Lucifer rebelled against God, and he wanted to take the earth as his domain. But he couldn't. Did you know that? until Adam handed it to him. Adam gave it to him. And that is why God had to reinstate his authority over planet Earth. And that is why God had to rescue planet Earth from the foreign invaders of his property. And he exactly did this 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The Lord's ownership of the universe. Secondly, the Lord's offer is the ultimate. Look with me, please, at verses 3 to 6. Verse 3, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? The answer is very simple, no one. No one is good enough to stand before God. No one is righteous enough to stand before God. No one is pure enough to stand before God. No one is clean enough to stand before God. In David's day, only the high priest who goes through all sorts of rituals, he goes into the Holy of Holies once a year and for the briefest of time. And he goes in there in dread and fear, lest his life will be snuffed because of his sin and the sin of the people. So he offers a sacrifice of his own sin first. Then he offers a sacrifice on behalf of the people. And these sins were only covered for one year. They have to come back the following year. Why? Because animal sacrifice cannot permanently remove sin and the stain of sin. They had to come back year after year after year because the blood of bulls and lambs only provide temporary covering. Never permanent solution to sin. Never permanent forgiveness of sin. Never forgiving and forgetting. But something else you need to know about Old Testament redemption, the concept of the Old Testament redemption. Only a kinsman redeemer can really redeem you. Remember the story of Boaz and Ruth? You know what the two qualifications that a kinsman redeemer has to have? First of all, He's got to be a relative. He's got to be related to you. And secondly, he has to be very wealthy. He's got to be so wealthy that he can pay the price of redemption, that he can become a kinsman redeemer. And beloved, let me ask you this, who is richer than the one who owns the universe? No one. And why do you think Jesus taught us, his children, to say, our Father? This is not a a prayer that people rattle. I've been in churches where people say, oh, Father, and they just muddle through it. No, he taught his children to look up to heaven and call his father our father. Um, Jesus is not just trying to be nice. Jesus is not just uh, trying to make you feel good. No, 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 no. It is because we become his beloved children through the blood of Jesus. We become his relatives, <laughs> and we have to be relatives in order he may redeem us. We have to become relatives for him to become our kinsman redeemer. And if you're not relative of Jesus, if you're not relative of the Father, today you can be. Repent of your sins. Turn to the only one who can forgive you and redeem you, not just in this life. He redeems for eternity. Churches are focused so much on this life that we have lost sight of eternity. It's one of the saddest things in the modern 21st century evangelical church. The Lord's ownership of the universe, the Lord's offer is the ultimate, and the Lord's overcoming is unavoidable and inevitable. 
Look with me, please. The last three verses. Do you know that five times, five times in these three verses, the Holy Spirit inspires David to speak of Christ, to prophesy of Christ as the King of glory. Do you get it? Five times. And the challenge or the question comes in twice. (laughs) Who is the King of glory? First answer. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Then comes the second question, second challenge, as if to say, I didn't hear that. Who? Who? And he gives you the emphasis. He wants everybody to hear it. He wants hell to tremble. He wants Satan to tremble. He wants the enemies of God to tremble. He is the king of glory. He is the almighty, conquering king of glory. Listen to me. Beloved, the church of Jesus Christ is made up of sour, moping, sulking, complaining servants of God. No. The church of Jesus Christ is made up of soldiers of the mighty army of the conquering Jesus. Let's live like it. I confess to you that I think that what we made of the church of Jesus Christ in the West probably make the angels want to hide their faces. We're not serving a weakling, defeated, dead hero. We are the soldiers of the conquering Lord. Therefore, Everyone who knows him must start living as a conquering soldier. Instead of living in fear, we should be sending terror into the heart of the devil. We should be sending terror into the very pit of hell. Instead of living in defeat, we need to live in victory as we surrender to the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty in battle. Doesn't say the Lord wimpy in the struggle. He doesn't say the Lord struggling with the strugglers and and he's broken with the broken. Come on now. I want to tell you something very, very important. Last, those two verses here in this psalm. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. Between verse 9 and verse 10, there is a space of long centuries of this, what we call the age of grace. What do I mean by this? Listen to me. The Lord Jesus right now is gathering his own from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation. The conquering Lord Jesus is now calling his elect from every corner of the globe. We are seeing for the first time in history great evangelical leaders turning their back on the gospel. Meanwhile, terrorists, convicted terrorists who are becoming converted to Christ, and they now are evangelists. And you and I, my beloved friends, are God's instrument of calling many of his children to come home. So that we, with them, can experience the joy of reunion in heaven with Jesus. I'm going to say more about this in the next message. But, beloved, I am absolutely convinced right now Jesus is gathering his own to get ready for that reunion in heaven. He's gathering all those who are heaven-bound. And it may be sooner than we may think. When the trumpet shall sound... And the world will come to a standstill. Then as the people who are left behind look up and see the church of Jesus Christ, the faithful soldiers of the cross, ascending into heaven, going into the sky, moving upward, just like Jesus did when he was ascended into heaven. They will be rising from the highways and the byways, from airplanes, from workplace, from farms and from factories, from prison where they've been prisoned for the sake of Christ, from every corner of the seven continent. There are people who's going to be lifted up just like Jesus was ascended on that day. And those who are left behind, 
they're going to look up and they see it with their own eyes. I say what I'm going to say with sorrow in my heart. As they see us on our way home, it's going to be too late for them. It's going to be too late. Those who have rejected Jesus as the only way to heaven and salvation, those who have tried to modify Jesus, those who wanted to stretch Jesus to fit their own concept, those who worshiped a weak and weakling Jesus, they will call upon the Lord, but it will be too late. And I can imagine, I can only imagine, some of them are going to go to one of these dead churches. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> you know what I mean. They're going to go to these dead churches looking for answers, but they're not going to have answers. These people in those churches they are in worse shape than they are. For they knew and they rejected the truth. They're going to knock, but there was no one to open the door. They will seek, but they will not find. And they will ask, but no one to answer. As our conquering Lord Jesus leads our parade into heaven, and the angels will ask, he will point to his redeemed, and they say, who is the Lord of glory? He will point to all his redeemed and say, these are my soldiers. These are the faithful men and women, boys and girls who believed in me, trusted me for their salvation. They are victorious in battle with me. Open ye gates of heaven, and heaven will open, and we shall descend with the Lord. And the Lord says, and the Word of God said, we shall be with the Lord. For how long? How long? I pray to God that not a single person, either watching or here in this building, who does not know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ would walk out of here in the same way you came in. Connect with Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef at ltw.org. There you can find today's message, shop the store for powerful resources, and discover how God is moving around the world. Download the free Leading the Way mobile app. Find us on Roku, subscribe to our podcast, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Engage with the Bible and God's global work at ltw.org. Anytime, anywhere, any place. You know, my friends, this book has been an eye-opener to thousands of people around the world. I hear it from Europe to Australia to United States. People say this book really helped them understand what's going on. So I want you to get your copy. Every time you read about a judgment from God in the Bible, it is the consequence of God's people making wrong choices. This pattern occurs again and again from Genesis through Revelation. And today, the West is facing the nightmare of Islamic terrorism. But the question is, what choice will we make? Now, Dr. Michael Youssef has written a remarkable book, The Barbarians Are Here, preventing the collapse of Western civilization in times of terrorism. Regardless of what you hear in the media, defeating the threat of Islamic extremism isn't about more money, more education, or more tolerance. And that's why this landmark book is so important. If you read only one book this year on the possible annihilation of Western culture, this should be that book. From the perspective of a PhD on the subject, his Middle Eastern heritage, his life's work as a respected Christian leader, and backed by decades of research, this book will transform your perspective on the greatest threat the world is facing. There is hope, but we must act with a knowledge that those who seek to destroy our nation will never abandon their quest. The clock is ticking, so cut through the haze of politics, political correctness, and media bias and get the facts you need to know. The Barbarians are here. 
Preventing the collapse of Western civilization in times of terrorism. Available now for your gift of any amount to Leading the Way. Call or visit us online at ltw.org to order your copy today. I want you to celebrate with me and with us at Leading the Way this milestone, 30 years of faithful ministry. We brought the gospel to many a living room and to many cars and radio, television around the world and here in the United States. It is my privilege and my honor and great joy to know that we have been ministering to you faithfully. As you know, I received no compensation from leading the way. It has been for 30 years, my labor of love. So I want you to join with me as we celebrate this great milestone in the life of this ministry. Dr. Yusuf, it is a pleasure to say to you, this is Jeannie and Otto Eggers in Roseburg, Oregon. We are delighted to wish you a 30th anniversary, Otto and I are celebrating 30 years together. We're so grateful for the preaching that you are giving us right in our own home from leading the way and from the Church of the Apostles. We pray for you every day. We pray for the Church of the Apostles. We're so grateful that we are hooked remotely to your church and God be with you. We are supporting you and praying for you every day. Uh, Dr. Yosef, it's a privilege to be under your ministry. I thank you so very much. And you've been a real leader for me. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you've come to my country and taught me from Egypt. <laughs> it's amazing. And I wish you the very best of all that Lord can handle you for, and don't give up too soon. Hang on as long as you can, because we need you. Thank you so much. And a happy 30th anniversary, yes, absolutely. Passionately proclaiming uncompromising truth, leading the way with Dr. Michael Yusuf. Thanks you for your faithful support through your continued prayers and gifts. At the Church of the Apostles in Atlanta, Georgia, every Sunday I meet people from all over the United States, from Maine to California, and they love the experience. They said, for years we've been wanting to come and visit. And so if you're ever in Atlanta, Georgia, I would love for you to come and visit. Shake my hand and I wanna thank you in advance for making that to be a priority in your life. Visiting Apostles, God bless. Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef is a paid program sponsored by viewers like you.